um, pretend to have knowledge which I don't have. Uh, so I won't do that. I would rather that you educated me. I can tell you, with the Cup of Nation champions, it's done. There are a lot of great players that, um, you know, have come out of this particular country. And the two boys that are doing very well in Austria, Enoch Mwepo and Patton Darka, um, performing very well when it comes to football right there in, in, in as far as their club is concerned. Fantastic. Well, it's good to know you've got superstars coming out of your country. Uh, and long may that continue. Um, I, I, I do think that the, uh, the development of... Uh, African football over recent decades has been a really uh, interesting thing to watch. When the World Cup was hosted on your continent, it was a great, great success. Um, and, and global football needs strong African football. And uh, if mm -hmm. Zambia can be at the top of Africa, then that, of course, is fantastic for all the supporters in your country. Mm -hmm. And that would take me now, Peter, to a question that a lot of Africans ask themselves. It's not easy to play in leagues like the English Premier League, but we see the likes of Sadio Mane, talk about Mo Salah, and many great players coming from Africa, you know, performing. But the question is, what does it take to perform in such a league? Very tough when you ask me. Yeah, well, it, it is probably the most scrutinised league in the whole of the world. Uh, everybody mm. appears to, to tune into it. And therefore, I think... At, at, at the most basic level, it takes a great strength of character because there is the sense that the whole world is, is looking at you when you're playing the game. So um, that strength of character probably underpins everything. And because there is such wealth within the league, uh, the English clubs, certainly the biggest English clubs, the Liverpools and the Manchester Uniteds and the Chelsea's, um, are able to pick from the very, very best. So mm. it is very, very hard to break into that league unless you are not just good, not just very good, but elite, elite. Um, and so clearly it takes immense talent and huge dedication as well. Uh, preparedness, I, th I think, to be perfectly honest, a lot of those of us in England who are, are fortunate to have this league on our doorstep, we often underestimate what an achievement it is for players, not just from Africa, but from other um, far-flung corners of the world. What an achievement it is to come into a foreign land where you don't necessarily mm. even speak the language, to have to settle, uproot mm. your family, and then perform at a very high level in front of the whole world. Not an easy thing to do at all. Not an easy one, because I can tell you, we've had, had one player uh, coming to England, playing for Portsmouth some time back in Collins in Besuma. Um, you know, spent only a short, just a short time at, at, at the club and the likes of uh, Emmanuel Mayuka joining Southampton, uh, some South, Southampton as well. Uh, but, but with that said, Peter, um, uh, let's now talk about the issue of determination. You've talked about someone has to work hard. It's the character. It's one of the toughest leagues and not only for African players, but all over the world that would love to join tough leagues. Um, that, you know, relates to English Premier League, talk about the German Bundesliga, Spanish Liga. They are great players. The question is, um, are you seeing us producing uh, a player of Lionel Messi's calibre, let's say Cristiano Ronaldo's calibre, as a kicker? Well, in a sense, yes. I mean, listen, you talk about Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo, Let's assume they're the best players in the world. They might be the best players in the world. One of them happens to come from South America. The other one happens to come from Portugal, uh, Europe. Um, OK, that's the case. But it isn't as if from various parts of Africa that the elite of football is unrepresented. I mean, you just have mm. to look at Liverpool's front line. Uh, you know, Mane and Salah, there they are, uh, two African players um, who are right at the top of, of their game. I don't think there's any reason to suppose that the next generation of greatest players won't also include um, a very good representation of Africans because it's proven. It's proven. I don't, I don't think Africa needs to feel any sense of um, footballing inferiority right now. Why should it? Why should it? Mm. I, what I think would be lovely, and, and I think it's 
sadly, probably some way off. What would be lovely would be if the uh, domestic leagues within Africa were, were strong enough to retain their own players because uh, that would be a great attraction, of course, for local supporters. And it would also, mm. if you have your own players in your own land and they are top-level players, then mm. the players around them will improve. You know, they will be... Uh, inspirations, as it were, on your doorstep rather than performing in another continent thousands of miles from home. Mm, mm. Uh, Peter, I'm sorry, we, we, we had to start on that note. I, I know we can unpack your life. We can start from the genesis of Peter Drury as a commentator, but because we are calling you from Africa and you were once in Africa in 2010 commentating the 2010 FIFA World Cup, um, Obviously, again, Africa has never won the World Cup itself. Uh, we're still waiting and anticipating as into when will that happen. But in your view, as we leave this page, how soon will it take for Africa to be crowned the world champion in as far as football is concerned? <laughs> it's a very, very difficult question to answer because even at any given World Cup, no given nation has uh, any certainty about winning it, even those that consider themselves the best in the world. Let's let's not forget in South Africa in 2010, an African nation got pretty close in the finishing mm -hmm. stages and was denied by Luis Suarez's hand. You know, mm -hmm. those things can happen to any nation at, at any time. And um, to win the World Cup, you've got to come through a group and then you've got to win a knockout game in the last 16, the quarterfinal, the semifinal and the final. So, listen, in England, we won the World Cup the year before I was born in 1966. People still talk about it. We're supposed to be this great footballing nation. But here we are 54 years on and haven't won it. Um, so um, if you ask me about Africa, I say that at some point, an African nation will get through the group stage of the World Cup and then it will be mm. the nation that has the lucky breaks in the last 16 and the quarterfinal and the semifinal and the final. Now, that could happen next time or you could be waiting 100 years. So, you know, mm. it's, it's, it's just this is a knockout competition which actually is decided, uh, certainly in its latter stages, at the margins, in the moments one kick of the ball, one lucky deflection, one handball, one poor refereeing decision. Uh, all of these mm. things contribute. And um, one day, the dice will roll kindly for Africa, I'm sure. Mm. I hope it will be the 2022 FIFA World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. And I don't listen. It would be, bri it would be brilliant for the world. If that, I, I really believe that. It would be brilliant for the world if an African nation were were to win the World Cup. Just because the because I know that the depth of feeling for the game is so great on your continent, mm. and and that that passion deserves success. That's right. All right, Peter. Now let's now shift our attention to your uh, life. Fifty three years ago, like I said, you were born. Nobody knew that you would be a household name today. Maybe we should ask you, did you know that you'll be this big, more popular than some of the players and stars in reflection to music, even some presidents? <laughs> well, first of all, Gaspar, I have to say, I don't perceive myself like that at all. Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I, I just do a job which I thoroughly enjoy and I'm very, very lucky to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's just a, a series of good pieces of fortune that, that lands me in a, in a very privileged position, which I enjoy, but I, I don't particularly enjoy, if I'm honest, the element of being known. I prefer mm. anonymity. Mm. I'm much happier quietly at home with my family. Um, and so that is not something I've sought or particularly relish. What I relish is just doing the job. Um, no, I came out of a household which loved its sport, but didn't excel at sport. Um, I, I loved watching it. I loved words. I grew up shouting about football like many, many small children, um, sort of pretending to be a football commentator. But I, mm. I didn't uh, actually believe that it would happen. And working for only for a month, um, you know, as an accountant, was that was a gamble, Peter? Leaving accountancy was the gamble. Um, 
yes, I did that out of university because it was what a lot of people did. I had my degree and I had to begin a profession. And so I did do a month training as an accountant. I wasn't very good at it, Casper, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess if I hadn't had a dream to pursue, I would have plowed on and, and got there in the end. Um, but uh, I did take the gamble and very, very fortunately it paid off. It's, if, if, if one of my sons came home and said he'd given up his profession in a, in a safe mm. uh, job and was going to try and become a football commentator, uh, I would have reacted probably in the same way as my father did, which was uh, with worry and angst and uh, a little bit of irritation. But uh, fortunately, I got lucky. That's right. And there's a lot that we can talk about between the day you were born up to date. And, you know, time obviously will not be our best ally, Peter. But my question would be, what is it that you did right between the first day you enter this planet and now for you to be this big? Uh, Gaspar, listen, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. That's all. I, if I were to tell you what I did right, that would that would make it sound as though it was some sort of plan. And that um, I, I set out for this to happen. Um, I, I hope I've tried to live my life in a, in a decent way and be good to people and, and authentic and behave in a natural way. Uh, and, um, and just from time to time, my, my planets have aligned kindly. Um, uh, or I have been blessed or I've been lucky, however you like to express these things. You know, I've had a, a series of good breaks. I've worked with good people. I've had good mm. bosses who've looked after my best interests. Um, and uh, I've just tried to, to work hard um, and uh, achieve what I can achieve. Uh, but, but if I said to you that there was any, anything specific I've set out to do, that would be misleading you. You know, in a way, it's been a series of accidents. You've frozen, Gaspar. I don't know if you can see me or hear me. I'll turn off my video in case it improves. Well, you're back. You're back. Yeah, we're back, Peter. Yes, we're back. My, my question was, which game was your first to commentate on and how was the feeling for you? I can't really remember what the first game uh, I commentated on. It would have been a lower league game for local radio. My first, um, my first uh, job, full-time job in broadcasting was, was the, with the BBC uh, local radio in the north of England. And uh, it would have probably been a match involving Bradford City or... Huddersfield Town, who were then in the third tier of English football. Um, and whilst I can't remember the specific game, what I can tell you is that my stomach would have been knotted with fear. Uh, I would have been, as I still am sometimes ahead of a big game, very, very nervous um, and um, probably not very good <laughs> because uh, my nerves would have inhibited me. But um, yeah, that, that would have been somewhere around... Uh, 1989, 1990. Mm, mm. All right. Absolutely brilliant. And I believe it's one of those moments that must be taught by a lot of people. Obviously, you are very happy when you tell your story where you started from in as far as commentating is concerned. Uh, now, Peter, again, the, the secret um, of preparing and putting up a very good performance in the commentary box um, there's so many commentators that we have. Others do a good job, others don't do a good job. But in your case, to stand out, Peter, I've heard you several times talking about good preparations, like you take a lot of time, seven hours or so, to prepare for a particular game. Uh, in your case, what is in the basket of preparation? Oh, well, the, the majority of it is factual preparation. A colleague of mine once said to me, ahead of a football match, it is our job as the commentator to know more about that football match than anybody else in advance, to, to be equipped with the facts that will be required under any given circumstances. So that is to say, 
have the right biographical and statistical details for every player who might or might not play, um, the full background of the history of that fixture, the history of the clubs, the context of the match in terms of where it sits in the league or the cup or whichever competition it happens to be. Um, the job is to have every base covered factually. And then as a final sort of piece in the jigsaw, um, I try, where time allows, to afford myself just a little time to think, um, just to think a little bit outside of the box, if you like, about um, the big picture. What is it, what the, broadly, what is this game all about? If this was the only game in the world, what would I say about it? You know, how, mm. how, where, where is it in the great scheme of things? Um, because you can get so caught up in the minutiae that you, you lose sight of what, I guess, most fans who are watching around the world are thinking about the game. They're not, if they watch Liverpool against Manchester United, they're not caught up in when did Virgil van Dijk last score a goal? Um, you know, how many times has Mo Salah appeared in the Premier League mm, this year? Mm, they're mm. caught up in what does it mean for Liverpool to play Manchester United? You know, and so sometimes so I think it's important to step back from all the really tight facts and figures and to, and to have a view, big picture view of what the match means. All right. Let's now talk about the fixture that you consider to be uh, one of the biggest, your best to have commentated on. Uh, there are so many games, Peter. I tell you, when you ask me to pick which one on your behalf, I can't manage because you're bringing the World Cup fixtures, you bring in the UEFA Champions League, you bring in English Premier League. They've got their own segments and, and nice things about them. And as a result, some of us, what we've done is we've compiled your works. This game has got its own, you know, things you can look for. Uh, for in as far as Peter's commentating is concerned, Barcelona, Roma, one of those games, you know, man, alas, the Greek god. Has... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my question, let me not be taken away. But my question is, uh, which f fixture or game you consider to be the best to have commentated on? Yeah, my, my view, um, uh, and uh, I hope you don't think I'm saying this just because there is um, an African note to it, but uh, genuinely, the game, the game I feel fondest about, I think, is probably what I call the Shabalala game. Um, mm, mm. South Africa against Mexico <laughs> uh, in Johannesburg in 2010. I thought, I just think it was a very meaningful football match uh, because... Goodness me, we're we're in a we're in a period in the, the history of humankind now where where race is probably the biggest issue. It's a mm. it's a fascinating time to be alive and and to learn and to observe. But um, that makes it feel all the more poignant to remember that day in two thousand and ten when um, this guy from Soweto scored a goal for the world. You know uh, and. It was so powerful in its meaning because mm. I, I, re I remember walking up to the ground that day and seeing, uh, you know, black and white football fans arm in arm together, united in a way that only sport can manage. You know, politics doesn't achieve that, but sport achieves that. And uh, it was a really beautiful occasion to be a part of. And his goal his goal was was a sort of crowning moment on that day. Yeah, and many will say, Peter scripts that. I mean, people, uh, whatever that people say about your your commentating, others will say, no, but you know what? Even if Peter doesn't agree to say, you know, you can't write a script for that. I mean, he writes. Um, you know, yes, uh, you, you, you've clarified. You've talked about how difficult it is to just imagine what would happen in a particular game. But just to emphasize um, where those words, the metaphors, you know, the figurative language that you use, just the right words pouring out on, on, at the right time on a particular game, where's the source of that? Uh, do you go to pray? <laughs> do you go to uh, seek for some divine power? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Gaspar, no, I, 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 what I do do is think about it. And that, that I must say that there's a distinction between thinking about it and scripting it. For instance, that Shabalala goal, you know, mm, mm. 
um, that the words that came out, whatever they were, first of all, I think I did use some sort of Afrikaans word in there somewhere. Now, clearly, I didn't know that word until uh, I mm. approached the mm. South African mm. the day before and said, listen, what is the word that you would use for a great moment of excitement? And so that is a word that, yes, I've written down. But that's rare because I'm dealing with a foreign language there. And I think, yeah, that's it would be smart to use that word in the moment. Mm, so, mm, of mm. course, of course, that is prepared. Um, I, what I had to be was disciplined enough to know that if the moment didn't call for that word, not to use it. The rest on that particular occasion is about not scripting it, but having um, a sort of source of thought. Um, so... I talked about a goal for all Africa and that that was not a line I'd written down a goal for all Africa. But I had thought beforehand, listen, this is about the African continent. It's not just about South Africa. This is about a World Cup, which has come to this continent for the first time and which certainly in racial terms is really important. Um, you know, and that day of black and white united was powerful. And so that, that sort of thought process was going on within me. And so when this goal, which happened to be, thank goodness, a really great goal, it wasn't just any old goal, it was a really great goal, it, it enabled me to pour forth all these thoughts. And, and you know, um, I always say to people that, that people are kind enough to remember these special goals, but it's also important to remember that most goals aren't mm. particularly special. You know, these are once in a... Once in a few years, these goals go. <laughs> and thousands and thousands of other goals happen. That's which right. Aren't, which, aren't, which aren't like that. You know, if, if I tried to make every goal like the Shabalala goal, that would be ridiculous, you know, um, because you, you can't have the same depth of feeling ahead of every game as, as I had ahead of that game. I agree with you. I agree with you, Piro. And I believe that many are agreeing with you. They do agree with you because those that have tried to do, you know, that as in writing, uh, you know, scripts before going, uh, you know, to commentate on a particular game, it doesn't work. I've tried myself. There are times when we were doing some training uh, with Supersport, you know, Africa here in Zambia um, for the gift training program where some of us were born in as far as presenting is concerned. Uh, you could write certain things, you listen to Peter, you get Peter's words, you, yeah, you, you get uh, John Champion's words, even, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Gleason, the South African commentator, on commentators here, the likes of Martin Bankonje. Um, I mean, but it doesn't work. There are certain no. things that will come on a particular game and you never thought it would. And then you run out of words because what you want, you're looking where to fit those words into. Yes. That's, that's the danger. The, 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 probably the smartest example I ever give uh, is around the famous game where Manchester City won the Premier League with the last kick, the Aguero goal. Um, mm. Now, a lot of people would have been tempted on that day to have words ready because the likelihood was that Manchester City would, in very plain style, beat QPR and win the league. Now, if you had scripted a line for the goal that was scored to win Manchester City the league, you would not have scripted that moment, you know. So if you, having scripted that line, were tempted to use it, you would have failed to live up to the moment that it actually turned out to be. And that, I think, is a great warning to anyone who is tempted to preconceive a moment because the moment is almost always a little bit different to how your imagination thought it might turn out. Peter. The other question for you is, how has been life without soccer since its disruption due to COVID-19? Well, well, because I am blessed and I've been healthy and happy and surrounded by my family, I haven't felt the pain and angst that I know a lot of people around the world have. So let me first of all say that I'm not being glib about this. I know that there has been an awful lot of pain and anxiety, uh, and I feel immense sympathy for those who have suffered. For me... It has, though, just been a very gentle time. Um, and it's not been bad um, to be reminded that there are more important things than football, actually. You know, it's it's been lovely to spend time with my wife and two of my three adult sons have come back home to 
um, to lockdown. And so I've had bonus time with them. I've been able to read. I've been able to run. I've been able to ride my bicycle. Um, mm. and, uh, you know, it's it's been a really good, refreshing period, actually, and a reminder of the things in life that really matter, which is not to say that I haven't missed football, because I have. And uh, like so many others, I'm itching for it to return now. Mm. I believe uh, you miss, you know, spending time on the microphone, uh, wanting to speak. Do you feel like at some point, uh, like, you know, uh, I, I wish we, I was in, in, in the booth, in the commentary uh, booth uh, and stuff like that. Do you at some point, yes, it's good to spend time with your family, your wife and relatives, uh, because your job, uh, week in, week out, you are away from them, you know, doing work and preparations also deny uh, your your relatives that time which they want to be with you. Uh, but uh, during this period, before lockdown, post lockdown, and what, 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 are there moments where you've gone like, ah? Oh, I miss soccer. I miss <laughs> being in the commentary box. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I haven't got that bad, but I, I think I, listen, Gasper, if somebody had said this was forever, I really would be beating the table and, and uh, driving myself crazy. I think I've always believed, even out of my ignorance, that it can't last too long. And, and you know, God willing, that is the case, and it really is going away. Um, what, what I think what I lack is that chance to feel the adrenaline you know, the, the thrill that comes with match day. Um, so I, I haven't had a chance to get rid of that adrenaline and, and I'm mm -hmm. working up mm -hmm. towards that now. Um, I hope that without supporters, that adrenaline still exists in the same way and that we're able to, to generate the same excitement. I think we probably will because the games will be high stakes games. It'll be the end of the season. There'll be, um, you know, titles and Champions League places and relegation all to be decided. So, I think the games are going to be exciting. It's going to be very, very different. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think the chance to get rid of some of that adrenaline will be a good thing. Tell me, just whisper to me, what are some of the lessons that um, you've learned as an individual, as a family, and uh, we as people who are football fanatics have learned from the COVID-19 period? Well, as I say, I, I think probably the, the foremost of those is that sport is just a decoration on our lives, you know, but it is not our lives themselves. We, mm, we, mm, we've mm, learned mm, that mm. whilst we have this great obsession, um, there are more important things. And I, I can only repeat what uh, other greater people than me have said about sport and football in particular. It's a great line, but it's, it bears repeating that it is the most important of the least important things in life. You know, we, we love it, but it's, it's got to know its place in, in terms of the world's priorities. Um, I, I hope that this has been a really good time for the world to take stock um, and to remind itself that it's worth being kind to each other, you know, to understand each other. Mm. Uh, this, this, for me especially what is happening in America right now and, and, and the waves going around the world. This, for me, is a really important marked mm. moment in the mm. history of humankind. And if we can, if we can somehow, as a race, um, come out of it just a little less ignorant and a little bit more prepared to be mutually understanding and tolerant uh, and embracing of all creeds and cultures and colours, um, then, then this has been three months worth suffering, you know, for in, in, in many ways. Uh, mm, mm. I really, really hope that is the case. I hope we just don't go back to normal, close our eyes, plough on and be the way we used to be. Uh, you know, let, let's hope it's a real window of opportunity. That's right. Coming back to the English Premier League as we wind up, Peter, it's coming back on the 17th of June 2020. Not 2021. It's this year, <laughs> this month, probably next week, on a day like this one. 
um, the league comes back, starting with uh, the rescheduled fixtures, of course, that were disrupted due to COVID-19 itself. Um, how is your schedule like in as far as uh, the return of the English Premier League? And John? Uh, it's mad. It's a mad schedule, Casper, but I'm really excited by it. Uh, I will be uh, next Wednesday at Manchester City against Arsenal, and then on Friday at Tottenham against Manchester United, and then on Saturday at Watford against Leicester, and then on Sunday at Everton against Liverpool, uh, and so on. I can't remember after that, but uh, so on. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of travel up and down the country, and uh, I can't wait to get stuck into it. Hey, Peter. That's that's loaded. That that's that's a marathon, if you were to ask me. Yeah, yeah, but it's a it's a marathon. I can't wait for. All right, and, and quickly, Jim Beglin will be with you as you'll be doing Man City Arsenal, I guess, at the Artihad Stadium. You guys uh, seem to be working well. I saw his tweet last night saying. Um, uh, the restart project Premier League. It means a trip to the Artihad with the, my main man Peter. I was like, "Wow, we can't wait for that." Just like you guys um, uh, work so well. And my question has always been: Have you ever argued or quarrelled with um, you know Jim Begling on a on a light or not? If you if you knew Jim, you, he's a very difficult man to fall out with. He I mean he's he has uh, Irish charm. Uh, he smiles, he's good fun, he understands football like I never could and helps me in that respect. He, he had a very, very good, albeit sadly short because of injury playing career. Um, he's a good, humble family man and uh, I can't imagine a circumstance in which we would fall out. Except I would say this, if you're talking about a lighter note. Jim is such a nice guy that he will talk to anybody, mm. anytime. And sometimes if we're in a hurry, you know, we're up against it. There's a deadline. We've got to get up and take our positions uh, on the, in the commentary booth. Uh, I'm constantly saying, Jim, will you come now? Will you come now? And he said, just coming. And then he has to talk to somebody else for five minutes. And then he has to talk to somebody else for five minutes. He can't walk away from anyone, Jim. That's his only fault. Uh, but it's not a bad fault to have. All right, a very good friendship, and uh, I love the the, combina the combination. The pairing is absolutely fantastic because you guys uh, put up a very good job, and I believe you've seen people. Um, I don't know if now you're back on, uh, not really back, or you've joined social media because the last time I checked, you said you're not a fan of, you know, social media. But Jim Beglin is there. I don't know if you people share the information as into what people say regards to your partnership in the commenter box. Well, yes. I mean, Jim, as you rightly say, does Twitter and so on. I, I choose not to um, because it sort of blows my mind. I mean, that's another topic um, which we probably don't want to go into. But I'm, I'm not, I, I find social media too much for my head, uh, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. You know, I like to live a private life and that's fine. Jim enjoys being on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes he, he shares with me uh, what appears on there. And that's good. That works for me and it works for him. Um, All right. So, so we're happy with that. All right. Yo, I believe it will be very difficult to be in the commentary box. I'm not sure if you'll be in the commentary box or you'll be doing it from the studio, like what others are doing in German. Um, well, uh, we're going to be at the venue. We're going to be at the stadium. So um, very much looking forward to that. It's going to be a new sort of broadcasting challenge. Um, yeah, it's uh, funny enough, in the UK, I've been working these last few days on the German football um, from my own house, which is a, you know, a whole new experience and has been strange. So I'm very much looking forward to um, getting out into the uh, Premier League stadia and um, and expressing something new, actually. You know, it's 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 going to to be um, a test of broadcasting skill because mm -hmm. uh, this is mm -hmm. going to be different. No fans, Peter. How does that affect your job, especially well, that noisy? This, this is what I'm saying, Gaspar. It's going to be different um, because, uh, on the whole, we raise our voices because we're surfing the wave of crowd noise. You know, we're, we're going with the mood. 
and there won't yeah. be that mood, you know. So yeah. I, I, it's going to be a case of working it out as we go along. The reason commentators shout when the ball goes in the goal is because there are 40,000 other people shouting. So do we still shout when there aren't 40,000 other people shouting? Um, or do we speak as I'm speaking to you now, conversationally, which itself I think would sound strange to people because they would think, why are you not getting excited here? Um, so we're going to have to uh, mm. establish a means of working and, and try to work out what people want from us. Peter, I hope you will take care of yourself even as you do your work in the commentary box. Um, obviously, protecting yourself from COVID-19. I don't know how scared you are because it means Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, days to come, you'll be waking and fixtures will be coming fast and furious. Um, you should be safe. I believe you are. You definitely take good care of yourself. Thank you, Gasper. I will. I, I think I'm very fortunate, as I've already said, and I think that these Premier League grounds will be uh, the safest bubbles conceivable. I really do think that. So I think I will be perfectly safe. By the way, don't worry about me infecting the players either. I don't think I'll be allowed anywhere close to the superstars, uh, which is quite right too, because they will have been in their little isolation bubbles. Uh, I think it's being worked out very, very um, immaculately. Uh, so I'm, I'm very convinced that all will be well. Um, there are there are people in much less safe circumstances than me. So they are the ones who should take care. You take care. Everybody take care. And let's enjoy the return of football together. All right. Before, before, we, cut, before we cut the line, Peter, uh, let's give it to one team. This league. Is it going to Anfield? Is it for Liverpool? Uh, or maybe we might be surprised that things change. Well... It would be quite a change. If it was even remotely close, I might say to you, Gasper, that maybe Liverpool would be the team that comes out of this lockdown and for some mental or physical reason isn't quite prepared and they could stall. But it's not remotely close. They have a 25-point lead. They've got to win two games out of nine. And that is if <laughs> Manchester City win them all. And I'm telling you, here and now, Liverpool will be champions finally your last word and your encouragement to anyone who wants to make it big in life talking about commentators uh you know that you know are growing just coming up the up and coming footballers you know presenters anything especially commentating because that's your feud and um that is the more reason why a number of people love what you do and they follow you um you know passionately your last words to that one person who wants to make it big, either as a footballer, as a coach, as a commentator, as anything in life. OK, I would say this. Find a balance, if you can, between being strong enough and proud enough to believe in what you do, but humble enough to listen and learn from everyone around you. That is life's balance to strike. And if you can find that balance, uh, I think, I hope it'll take you a long way. Peter, would you just share with us the first line that you'll be able to use when, uh, you know, you're, you're back in hard. <laughs> <laughs> you, you flatter me that I'm that prepared. Um, I haven't thought about that first line yet. I think probably the first line will be good evening. But I, 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 think, um, I think I will say something along the lines of it has never, never been, uh, never have I more sincerely welcomed you to a game of football than I do tonight because it is such a thrill to be back. Something, something along those lines. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, <laughs> because the very thought of it makes me well up. I'm, I, I think I might feel quite emotional. When it's when it's time to say hello again. So um, yeah, some something something that says welcome back in a big way. From the start of our conversation up to the end, this point, if you were to put it in words, I don't care if you're gonna do it like you're commentating a game, uh, but describing our chat, 
describing our conversation, learning me, learning you, of course, myself, and some of the issues that we've tackled. What are some of the words that you would use? And make it as if it's a game, like, you know, yes, mention gospel or anything that we've discussed. Oh, well, well, it's, it, it's been a terrifically interesting and wide-ranging conversation. We've touched on the beginning. We've touched on up-to-date current affairs. We've touched, of course, on football. We've been right around the world. Uh, it's, it has been uh, a 360-degree chat. Hey, Peter, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gaspar. Really good to talk. We'll definitely chat someday. I've been discussing matters to do with football with Peter Dury, the legend himself, the well-known football commentator, talking to us about a number of things and as far as football is concerned. Obviously, we're waiting and anticipating to see what happens when the league resumes. That's the English Premier League. Plenty of stuff that we'll be able to watch. In his words, I remember some time back, Peter said, when will this league make sense? That was the game between uh, Leicester City and uh, Watford, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I remember vividly. Thank you very much for your time and God bless you. Great stuff, Gaspar.